is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for the NFL divisional market by talking to Erin Dolan of FanDuel, getting her read on the most interesting divisions in football and her favorite futures bets for this year. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Dr. Ed Fang. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. Ed, it is football time because it is officially August now. The Hall of Fame game coming yep. up on Thursday, but I'm having a hard time detaching myself from the Olympics because I thought the the swimming is going to be awesome, and it was. But then track came on, and I'm just fully convinced the track is awesome too. So I yeah. I have like this four year gap where I forget how fun the Olympics are, and then slowly remind myself throughout the two weeks. So oh yeah, this is this is actually really fun to tune into. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun for me too. I mean, getting up every morning and getting some track finals. 7 a.m., 8 a.m. Eastern time has been awesome. And uh, the 400 meter hurdle finals were both incredible. Yeah. Uh, I talked about it a little bit in my email newsletter. I talked a little bit about it on the show, but I suspected that a world record would go down possibly. Did you think events. it would go down by almost a second? Nope. Absolutely <laughs> not. So it was kind of incredible. So I, I mean, I had money on Rye Benjamin and. When I was watching the race, I wasn't looking at the time or, or anything. I didn't even look at the the clock when when they when they finished. I was just you know I was just a little bit upset that Benjamin didn't win. He was right yeah. there at the end. Warholm was just great, you know. And Benjamin broke the old world record by more than a half second, and and got the silver. Uh, great performance. Uh, he was pretty emotional after the race. Uh, you know, he's clearly a guy who thought he could win. And he definitely could have win, you know, and, but, you know, it was interesting. Like he said, he said he chopped his steps a little bit. Like he kind of screwed up his steps a little bit in the, in the beginning part of the race. And that's, that cost him the gold medal. And, and that's the challenge of the hurdles, right? You want to go faster. You want to go all out and you can kind of see on the second and third hurdle, like he just didn't have it. And then they were interviewing Warholm as well. And he was like, yeah, it was a perfect race for me. So I think we're going to see a lot more from these two. Yeah. The world championships in Oregon are only a year away. Um, and, oh, and we got to talk about the women, which was as phenomenal, a uh, great race between the two Americans, Sydney McLaughlin and, uh, Delilah Muhammad McLaughlin broke her world record only by 0.44 seconds, just such a disappointment, <laughs> you know, after the men's race, but she was incredible. But the thing about that race is that the, the, the Dutch runner Femke Bull was with the two of them for 350 meters. So it really looked like there could have been some upset city. But but it didn't happen. So just I mean, I think just two of the best races I've ever seen. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Well, watching the sorry, I don't remember his name, the Norwegian guy, uh, the Carson hurdler, Warholm. Warholm, watching him go over the hurdles. It was like they weren't there. It was so smooth. Yeah. The the fluidity with which he like jumped over them. It was absurd. Yep. It, it looks just looks kind of looks like art, basically. Yeah, that that comes from a lot of practice. Yeah. But it was so, a, a really fun race. And I thought I thought he was toast once Benjamin caught him. He was like yeah. right there. But then yep. Warholm's like, no, nah, I got the afterburners, man. We're good. And sprinted away. And like, I know you, you had money on on Benjamin, but like and I was rooting for Benjamin because, you know, America. Yeah, yeah, America. But like to see him pull off that race and how close it was and yeah. to break the world record by that much it was still fun, even though the person I was pulling for didn't win. And I think that's the fun thing about the Olympics. You can see incredible stuff and appreciate it, even if it's not the person you were pulling for. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and from a betting perspective, you know, I had Benjamin at plus 175 and you have a race that close. I mean, there's only so, and the guy breaks the record world record by more than a half second. There's, right. there's only so, uh, so yeah. much upsetness you can have over that. It was a great race. You just enjoy it. Um, the reaction on Twitter was great. Yeah. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have some more races towards the end of this week as well. That will, uh, uh, there probably won't be that good, but we'll uh, hopefully have some more races that, that will be good. 
Well, there was one that was good for you, which we're going to talk about here in just a second and covering the past. Uh, but as a reminder, we do have Erin Dolan on today. Find her on Twitter at Erin Kate Dolan. Uh, she, of course, does stuff for us here at FanDuel. We're going to talk about NFL divisional odds for 2021. Talk to her about the Colts situation with Carson Wentz, Quinton Nelson, uh, both going down with foot surgery. Get her read on these divisions heading into this week. If you're looking for some player prop discussion, we had JJ Zacharyson on last week to talk NFL player props, his process for making projections, and his favorite props for 2021 you can find that by searching for covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts and if you like what you hear leave us a rating and review as well before we talk to aaron though got to go back to, to last week and talk about a winner for ed in steeplechase covering the past all right so last week here on covering the spread ed you were talking about steeplechase educating me on what steeplechase is and it sounds like it kind of nailed the analysis here because okay Tell me how to say this. Safian El Bacali? I believe that's, I'm going to let you say it because that okay. sounded good enough. But yeah. So you had Safian El Bacali to win gold in the men's steeplechase. El Bacali was plus 175 to win. You also were talking about a hedge and how you were talking about trying to identify someone you could get access to a, a powerful country for a long price. So you said Benjamin Keegan, kind of an interesting name at 13 to 1. And both runners medal. You cashed on El Bacali at plus 175 for gold. Keegan got bronze. So you killed it there, Ed. I feel like we need more steeplechase on the on the show. Well, I, so first of all, I forgot that I talked about that last week. I thought I talked about <laughs> Timothy Chariot, right? But that must that have was been two weeks, weeks ago. ago. Yeah, so that must have been yep. two weeks ago. I completely forgot I talked about that steeple. Um, so yeah, El Bacali was the fastest in the race, and he ended up winning. It uh, is really nice when that works out. Um, the women's steeplechase was a big hot mess. So I actually thought the Kenyans would would go one two in that uh with Kayang and and uh Kepkoich. Uh that that didn't happen at all. So the women's steeplechase this morning was incredible in that American Courtney Ferrix took off with about a kilometer to go. And she gapped the field. And uh uh a Ugandan woman ended up chasing her down, but she got silver, which is an incredible performance. Uh, for her, she's always been kind of the bridesmaid to Emma Coburn, who's been the dominant America American, the one that everyone thought uh, was going to medal or potentially win. Uh, Coburn had just had a bad race, just jogged it in, uh, just wasn't there. So uh, yeah, no, I'm glad I hit the men. Uh, what well, wasn't so <laughs> wasn't so great on the women, but that race was just kind of nuts. Yeah, I mean the men's the men are the only ones you talked about here, so no one would have to know, you know. Uh, yeah. But that one worked I'm out well for you. And oh, was El Bacali the one you talked about where he lost a race because the bell was on the wrong lap for him? No, so that was Keegan. Okay, okay. Yeah. And so this is a crazy stat. Kenya has ne not lost a steeplechase since we put a man on the moon. <laughs> so that was the first time that uh, a Kenyan had lost. So there are two Olympics in there in which a Kenyan didn't win, but that's because Kenya boycotted those two Olympics. Okay. So, um, you know, I mean, they got a bronze. Yeah. And, you know, it was a pretty, pretty tough field. But, uh, but that, that was the kind of dominance that we were looking at with Kenya. And it's, right. it's, uh, yeah, it came to an end. And I think finding, you know, longer odds access to Kenya was a smart way to play things, but also finding a guy who may have been under value based on results for things outside of his control. But the thought process there, very good and got close there with bronze, but hey, got the win either way with El Bacali. So a nice analysis there by Ed. More track and field coming up later on in the show from Ed as well. Before though, though, we got to talk to Aaron Dolan. Find her on Twitter at Aaron Kate Dolan. Check her out over at FanDuel. We're going to talk about divisional odds with her in just one second. But first, hey, baseball fans, FanDuel has a fun promotion going on called $5 Dinger Tuesdays. All you have to do is place a $25 plus dollar bet on the to hit a home run prop on any Tuesday MLB game. You'll receive a $5 side credit, $25 max, for each home run hit in the game by either team, regardless if your bet wins or loses. Head over to FanDuel on Tuesday to play the $5 dinger contest. Must be 21 plus and present Colorado, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. Refund issued as a non-withdrawable site credit that expires in seven days. Max refund $25. Terms apply. 
Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Colorado, 1-800-522-4700. In Iowa, 1-800-BETS-OFF. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. For confidential help in Michigan, 1-800-270-7117. In Tennessee, call the red line 1-800-889-979. Or in West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Covering the present. Let's bring Aaron Dolan into covering the spread to talk about the NFL futures market. Aaron, it is football season officially with training camps underway. How are you doing today? I'm great and so excited for the NFL season. I feel like I've been waiting for this for many, many months now. So I'm excited it's about to start. Yeah, and it's there's been some downtime for you between the end of basketball wrapping up yeah. and between when NFL is starting. So have you had time to kind of like rest given the crazy sports schedule we've had here recently or has it just been you know research and getting set for football this whole time well it's been a lot of research but it's also been a lot of downtime which i'm not good at so i'm trying to force <laughs> myself to try to relax which then leads me to TikTok, which then leads to wasting a lot of time so <laughs> there's been a mix but i'm trying to relax because i know it's going to be crazy until basically february do you like TikTok? because like i haven't like i always see TikToks on twitter because i'm a big twitter guy yeah. and I see TikTok outside the context of TikTok and they always seem very strange. We're not viewing them like consecutively and stuff like that. So like to me, I, I can't get it. Like I respect it in the content, but like I, it, they seem just so different from other stuff I consume. Yeah. It's so different, but you can get so much more engagement and views so quickly yeah. and following. So the problem is though, if you open the app, like for me, if I don't open the app, I'm fine. But if I open the app, it's a good four hours. Like I am <laughs> not addicted. Like last night I was on it till one, one o'clock in the morning. I was like, I'm going to bed by 10 and I was on till one. Right. So I got to have some discipline, but rough. Luckily, Twitter is upsetting enough where I can usually close it pretty quickly. So that's, that's the one plus side of Twitter being <laughs> the worst. Uh, so let's talk about some NFL futures markets here and talk yeah. about divisional betting. And it's training camp, Aaron. We see a lot of tweets. We see a lot of headlines and stuff like that. And obviously, injuries matter for the futures market. That does impact a lot of things. We'll talk about the Colts in a second. But there can be a lot of other noise. And it's hard to pick through what's noise, what's important. So what do you actually glean from those practices in trying to decide how you want to view a team in the futures market? Or do you just have to kind of ignore most of it and, and try to find just the very few morsels that do matter? Well, I feel like as a journalist, your goal is obviously to find those storylines, provide people with some type of unbiased information. So in terms of the practices, I think you need to make sure you're following the articles and information that's pertinent to what you're looking for. Some of the advice, obviously, coming from the Sharp Angle podcast by Warren Sharp is you don't just want to have somebody say, oh, such and such player looks good at practice and then go bet a futures on them. I think I should also preface this response with obviously – People that bet into the futures market might be different than people that bet game to game. So for me, it's a very long season, so it's kind of a mix. Futures aren't my favorite bets to place, but in terms of the futures market and deciding where there is value, I look at the schedule, players added, look at how they did last year, any of the important changes that they've made. But I think a good example for this is when I was doing research for this show in particular, the Titans to win the AFC South. Last season, they were great on offense, terrible on defense. So what did they change? Well, they brought on Bud Dupree. So then I looked up as basically an example of this how is he doing oh he just got off the COVID list which then segues <laughs> into the harder pill to swallow for the nfl which is we're gonna have to deal with COVID once again and that can obviously right. impact the futures market but i think each team is a tad different when looking into the futures market meaning they could have a new qb new head coach so i think going and searching for pieces of information that you feel is necessary to then make a futures bet is more important than just scanning all the information and hoping to kind of gather what could happen so basically you're pre-selecting what things you want to know and mm -hmm. then seeking out that info. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, what, what, what were your final conclusions on Tennessee's defense? Cause that's a team I've been looking at as well. I mean, I, I have some real questions about the secondary, but what, what are you thinking? Well, they should technically be better since they were so terrible last year, but they're so right. good on offense and they can score. So that's kind of, what the it comes down to but they're gonna have a different play caller this year they're not gonna have arthur smith anymore so that can make an impact but more so just looking at them i love the titans but every article i've read is saying fade the titans and take the under on their win total so for that reason it's the one thing that i keep reading consistently i am betting the over and fading everyone just in case it does happen and i can say hit it well i'm glad about that because my numbers say titans over nine and a half as well love it and i've been hesitant to actually like pull the trigger in part because 
I had concerns around the defense, mm-hmm. uh, but Brandon Gadula did a good study at mm-hmm. over on number fire about how teams who have outlierishly bad defenses one year tend to outperform their win, their win totals next year because of what you alluded to. They can't be that bad again for the most yeah. part. Um, so I think that's pretty interesting with them. And I've been just hesitant to actually, you know, pull the trigger on betting the over nine and a half because I do worry about those things, but I at least feel better knowing that you're on the same page too. <laughs> yeah. Well, just a little bit. I mean, you're looking at a defense that's going to rely on rookie JC Horn to kind of hold up that secondary. So I'm going to fade both you guys. I'm gonna, I, I, I'm, I'm going against Tennessee. Um, All right. But but Aaron, let's move on because uh, I'm really interested in your uh, opinion about the Colts situation. Carson Wentz is out indefinitely. He's uh, he's getting surgery, and I guess this gets us right back to the Titans because they're minus 120 to win the AFC South. Uh, last time I checked, FanDuel Sportsbook. Um, are you seeing any value in these division odds? So for one, I just want to say don't see value on the Texans with Deshaun Watson situation right now. Not to no. mention the Texans have a terribly hard projected schedule the Jags for me no go you have rookie Trevor Lawrence first year NFL head coach Urban Meyer so despite them having an easier schedule I've just crossed both them off of course that leaves us with the Colts Titans although it is a weak division technically Tennessee will face more difficult schedule we kind of talked about this but I still like they're over for win totals they're going to face NFC West teams and AFC East plus the Chiefs Steelers and the Saints so that's pretty tough then for the Colts they have a tough five games to start the season including two meetings with the Titans in the first eight weeks. So in terms of the Titans, we kind of talked about this. They were great offensively, ranked fourth in pass efficiency, third in run efficiency, eighth in explosive pass efficiency, 10th in explosive run efficiency. They also ranked second in touchdowns per game, but they struggled really hard defensively. They did add Bud Dupree, like I mentioned. They also added Julio Jones. And I also talked kind of already about this. Arthur Smith is heading to the Falcons. So we'll have to see if Todd Downing does want to continue the heavy pass offense. Then as for the Colts, I, as you know, as you can see from the helmet behind me, (laughs) am an Eagles fan. So um, (laughs) he's not really going to be Phillip Rivers. And he he does have history with Frank Wright in Philly, but he needs to be 100% healthy. Also have that confidence, which I don't think it's great to start off with a foot injury. No pun intended there. Um, So to circle back, I do think there's value on the Colts. If you trust Wentz, I personally don't. I never would. He's missed 13 games in his career due to injury, including the playoffs. So I'm going to stay with the Titans here, get them while you can, because Tennessee could have three winnable games in the first five games. So the line can move out even further as opposed to the Colts who'd be playing the Seahawks, Rams, Titans, Miami, and Baltimore in the first five games. And those five games, they probably, they might not have Carson Wentz, Quinton Nelson, or Mm -hmm. Eric Fisher. And I done a piece for number fire pinpointing teams with tough early season schedules. And they were like the team that stood out the most as being a team that had a tough go. I I had them as underdogs their first five games to begin with. And then suddenly that was before the Quentin Nelson injury, before the Carson Wentz injury Mm -hmm. that made things a lot grimmer. So I I agree. I think that there may still be value in the Titans. They are in that schedule as well. So they actually do benefit directly Mm -hmm. from the Quentin Nelson, Carson Wentz injuries. And I find that super interesting. Let's, let's, let's pretend that Wentz had not gotten hurt. What would have been your confidence level in him going to this offense, given you've watched him a lot, you know, from his days of the Eagles, what, what would have been your confidence level before all this bad stuff? happened? I mean, he would, he's going to be put in a better situation with the Colts regardless, because mm-hmm. the Eagles had an insane amount of injuries. The team was not getting along. There was a coaching issue. There was a quarterback issue. I just think Carson Wentz is a do or die situation for him at this point. This season, he needs to play lights out and starting off of course with foot surgery does not help. Um, obviously he has experience with Frank, Wright, Like I said, but I just, his confidence level, like he's not a Phillip rivers. He doesn't come in with the craziest, you know, stat lines. Obviously I think everyone keeps talking about his MVP season. That was when he was on the road to that before his injury, but it's been a few years. I think we need to wrap it up with that kind of conversation and maybe he's just not a QB one. Yeah. And that was also situation where they had like these crazy numbers on third and long yeah. not really sustainable stuff going on there so i think mm-hmm. that it's smart to don't overlook that so let's talk about his old team here at the eagles and talk about them they're plus 470 to win the nfc east and that's actually the shortest odds of any team with the longest odds in their division so this looks like the nfc east is shaping up to be a bit of a toss-up cowboys are plus 130 do you see any value on any teams here in the nfc east divisional odds or too close to call for you 
So the NFC Leafs only needed seven <laughs> uh, wins last year to win this division. Shout out to the Washington football team. Did not expect that. I expected to be one of the worst divisions in the NFL once again. The Birds and Cowboys have an easier schedule projected, of course, as opposed to the Washington football team and Giants. For Dallas, starting off here, Dak's shoulder strain worries me already, especially after his compound fracture, dislocated right ankle that he suffered in week five last season. But let's not forget, he had 11 turnovers in those first five games with him under center. He went two for three in those first five games as well. We had Andy Dalton step in. That was a nightmare. He was concussed. Ben DiNucci then had to step in. Not ideal. Their defense was so, so bad. They actually spent their first six draft picks on defense this year. So that should hopefully help the Cowboys. But it's too much of a gamble for me to bet on them, even though on paper they should technically win this division. That leaves us, of course, three others. Washington football team has a tougher schedule, relies on Ryan Fitzpatrick, Phillies, Jalen Hurts, Nick Sirianni. Question marks for me still. But the Birds are coming off a terrible injury season, like I mentioned. So they ranked last in offensive line health and collective receiver help. So then for the Giants, Danny Dimes, third year, getting Saquon Barkley back. I don't feel great about that team either. So personally, you have a lot of markets you can bet on in the NFL. I would stay <laughs> away from this division. That's my advice here. It is so terrible, and it is a true gamble. Even though it's short odds, it seems like there's value on everybody. But it this will be another division. It's just a toss-up. <laughs> And that's that's part of the skill in gambling is knowing when not to pull the trigger this too, is, right? Do not bet this in this market <laughs> at all. I'm ready well, to make Aaron, a video about that today. Yeah, I mean the way you're breaking it down, it, it's it's interesting to me because like clearly two teams have the better quarterback situation, Dallas and and uh, and Washington. Uh, Fitzpatrick is you know not elite, but um, I think that kind of that that kind of me pushes me that way in some sense, especially with the young Washington defense as well. Um, I think so, be yeah, but I'm now. trying to stay away from this as well. I feel like Ryan Fitzpatrick won't be able to play the same way he played in Miami. Yeah, he's he's a – the way that I view it is journeyman quarterbacks are often journeymen for a reason, and that's the hesitancy I have. Like when I'm making all my projections for their passing efficiency is I can't go too high because – Right. Journeyman for a reason. Like that's that's the yeah, way that I, I – that's the hesitancy right. I run into. But, but journeyman actually gives you some stability, which I think is probably going to be good for that franchise, right? I mean, you're not yeah. throwing out Dwayne Haskins there and and what they had Alex Smith. I guess Alex Smith was kind of a journeyman. Taylor stability. Heineke, man. But yeah. then you might yeah. see a situation like Nick Foles where they only have magic for like a certain amount of time. True. And then it's kind of a bust. Yep. Yeah. Well, Nick Foles. Yeah. We'll never leave our collective conscious. Uh, the NFC West is pretty interesting, too. And we we're talking about the East and how it's interesting there. But I think it's different with the West because there aren't as many open question marks with each team mm -hmm. here. So we can kind of have a better read on this division. The 49ers, you, you were talking about schedule a lot. They benefit from the schedule. They're plus 185. The Rams are plus 195. Seahawks plus 270. Do you have anyone standing out here in this division at the current odds? So, of course, we go from the worst division to the hardest division. Right. The <laughs> NFC West is the only division to have three teams as favorites to make the playoffs. So, toughest division by far. Each team, I think, stands out for different reasons. The 49ers sit at as favorites even after a disastrous season due to injury. They're projected to be the best in the division under Jimmy G. And then, obviously, I've been reading great reports about Trey Lance. Everybody's talking about him. Plus, Kyle Shanahan is no rookie at this thing either. Then, for the Rams, they're obviously going to be seem, seemingly a threat, especially in terms of the odds makers' eyes. But I just wanted to note that Matthew Stafford has not won a playoff game with the Lions in 12 season seasons 0 and 3, which obviously this is a totally different situation, different team. But LA is really relying on him hard this year. And then as for the Seahawks, Russell Wilson, one of the best quarterbacks, plus the defense will pick up. But there is the issue of is there going to be that team chemistry? Because obviously he was a little bit unhappy with the organization during this offseason from some reports we read. And then a lot of people that I've been reading also love the Cardinals, who are right in the pack in terms of odds to win the NFC outright. I think there's value, of course, in the Cardinals at plus 600 if you think Kyler Murray and the new additions will be helpful. It's but it is a long shot for a reason, and that's why I'm kind of staying away from that. I think health is going to be the biggest competitive advantage in this division, but I would still take the 49ers now plus money because they play the Lions and the Eagles in the first two games, and that line is going to move out if they win those two right off the bat. And I still think right now plus money, it'll be good to get them, and I truly do think they'll win this division. Do you have any concerns about, I mean, obviously the reports are that Trey Lancer is, is looking great at camp, but obviously it gets a little different when you're playing real NFL defenses. Uh, would that change your mind if they announced him as the starter tomorrow? 
It would a little bit, but I, I mean, I think they're going to start Jimmy G without a question. If he goes in and then doesn't play as well, or if something happens, at least they have a backup that will be good enough to play these teams. I think that what that does is it gives them a floor, a good floor, in the sense that they have, if you have options, and mm-hmm. if something happens with Russ, if something happens with Stafford, which already happened in practice when he hit his, his yeah. thumb on some guy's mm-hmm. helmet, you know? Same thing with the, the Cardinals. The floor for the 49ers is quite high, and I find that pretty enticing for sure. Let's talk here about in, in a division that I have not bet yet because I have no way idea how to read it because I personally don't love the Browns. My numbers don't like them as much, partly because, you know, rough defense last year, trying to project out what that will look like. The Ravens and the Browns, the favorites in the AFC North, uh, the Ravens plus 120, Browns plus 160, then the Steelers kind of lurking back there at plus 450. So what's your read on the AFC North right now? So obviously off the bat, crossing off the Bengals, although I do love Joe Burrow, (laughs) crossing off the Steelers, they're not going to replicate what they did last season. So with the Browns and the Ravens, I actually love the Browns. So the Ravens finished 11 and five last season, one of the best rushing attacks and one of the most dangerous offenses in the league. But I'm going with Cleveland based on the fact that they're projected to have one of the easiest schedules in the NFL. The Browns also have the most explosive offense with a quarterback on a rookie deal. In 2020, we know how great they were. They had so much success. And I just think considering their entire offensive line is coming back, Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt, they were great. Odell Beckham is going to be back after missing nine games due to injury. I think the Browns can get it done at plus 160 for sure to win this division. I do always love betting on the Ravens, but I think it's going to come a point where we're going to see a downslide because they need more pieces around Lamar Jackson. So I think with that one, what's interesting uh, there is you're talking about the additions to the Ravens, and it's not just the fact that they haven't beefed up, but they actually lost Orlando Brown their right tackle. He was a left tackle last year. He was going to be their, their right tackle this year once again. So they have added Rashad Bateman, Sammy Watkins, but you know, it's, it's depending on new guys to come in there and potentially be key contributors. That's why I haven't actually bet the Ravens at plus 120. And I agree that I like betting the Ravens. I think it's fun to root for Lamar Jackson. I want mm-hmm. to not root against him because it scares me. Um, yeah. But I think that it, it was just so hard to, to pull the trigger on the Browns at, at plus 160 because I was worried about the Ravens. That's what kind of pushed me away from the division. Uh, but I, I think mm-hmm. that plus 160 is a pretty fair number to get on Cleveland. I think that if I were to bet the Browns, I think this is the preferred market for me rather than their win total, which is to me that the win total seems a bit too high for me to bite there. I think it's like mm-hmm. 10 and a half right now. Yeah, that seems very high. I mean, maybe it's just overinflated from how well they played last season. I'm a little bit surprised by the Steelers being back plus 460. That seems, I I would assume it'd be more in the 200, 300 range, just considering how great they did play last season. I mean, I think we're going to see terrible regression from them, but still I was a little surprised by that. Aaron, we talked about four divisions. We have four other divisions that we have not covered individually. Is there any value that you are seeing in those other divisions? So in terms of the other divisions, I kind of just wanted to point out some of the markets that are on the FanDuel Sportsbook because maybe that will help people. I wanted to start off with win totals. Dallas, under nine and a half games. Dallas lines are usually overinflated. They are 14 and seven to the under since 2000. In 21 seasons, they've hit the over seven times. Only the Jags have been worse. Then for Seattle, we kind of already talked about them, but I also like their over nine and a half with Russ at QB, dynamic weapons outside. I think they can hit that over. Also, after reading Warren Sharp's guide, I learned that Seattle has never won fewer than nine games in a season and has won double digits in eight of nine seasons with Russ. So I'm banking on that. And then another random market that I think you can bet on, because of course there's some different ones that are on the FanDuel Sportsbook, if you dig there, is the worst regular season record. I think there's value with the Texans at plus 200. They only won four games last year. They have one of the toughest schedules and their team totals at four and a half right now, which is so, so low. But considering that Deshaun Watson issue i mean he did rank first in the nfl in passing efficiency on early downs last year but still there's a lot of things swirling with them and i think at plus 200 you could get that and hit and there is no chance he's starting this year based on the way they've been playing things in training camp and honestly it makes sense so uh we'll see how things play out there but that is aaron Dolan. we'll talk more about the seahawks later on the show as well some more seahawks love coming up in just a bit make sure you follow aaron on twitter at aaron kate dolan and check her out over at fanduel.com aaron we appreciate the time once again good luck to you as a gear football season hopefully we'll talk to you once again here soon of course thanks for having me covering the future Big thank you once again to Aaron Dolan for swinging by and talking about NFL divisional futures. And one thing we didn't dwell on there, but I think that she brought up that is smart. Once again, we're betting NFL futures and knowing when to bet a market. That's something that Whale Capper talks about a lot, Drew Dinsick a lot when we have him on the show. Looking at the schedule and identifying 
the proper time to buy into a market. And that's why I had a piece up on number fires mentioned looking at schedules, when things are tough, when they're easier, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, hey, if the Eagles start off with a really tough stretch, do not bet them before that stretch is done in the hopes of getting a better number. And I think last year too, with the, with the Texans, you knew they had the Ravens, the Chiefs, and I think it was the Steelers, their first three games, and that was going to be tough. So if you thought yeah. that you wanted the Texans, hold off, and maybe you can avoid calamity, which is what they ran into. So I think Ed, a good to get that reminder, as always when talking the futures market, of identifying the proper time to go into that market. Yeah, absolutely. I think that I think that's obviously very important. Um, it's honestly something I'm not particularly good at looking at, and so I'm going to try to be better. Uh, that Texans team was interesting last year because I don't know if I talked about it on the show, but I mean, I certainly bet them over seven and a half wins. Yeah. Uh, clearly didn't get there with their their nice four win total, but a lot of the numbers suggested they were about a seven win team. So uh, uh, it's going to be a lot different story this year, obviously, with the uncertainty around Deshaun Watson. And uh, well, actually, you just stopped there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they've, <laughs> yeah, they've had him playing defensive back during training camp. So very clear he's not in their plans at quarterback anymore let's move now to covering the future i'll talk about the nfl on my side of things bad you want to do some more track and field and with the way the steeplechase went why not let's dive back in talking about the men's 5000 which is a very long race uh what do you see in there oh it's not the longest it's, that's short compared to they the do 10. a marathon right well they do a marathon which is uh, an event in, of its own. Um, there, there's actually some odds on the marathon, which is which is pretty interesting. Uh, but let's stick to the 5,000 because I think this is a really interesting race. So there's a guy named Katir from Spain uh, that's the betting favorite in this. And he's really interesting because he was terrible before 2021. And he's coming to 2021 and run some really fast 1500s, run some really fast 5,000s. You know, probably should be the favorite. And, uh, you know, there's always questions when someone all of a sudden gets really good. It's like he found the super serum that made Captain America who he was. <laughs> um, and there's always questions about whether uh, I, I mean, I, there's always questions about whether any runner can kind of sustain like this short term success. So I'm a little bit more interested in betting on the guys that have had a longer track record of success. And in this case, it's the Ugandans. Uh, so Jacob Chilimo is the second uh, runner at plus 230. Um, he's an incredibly fast finisher, incredibly talented guy, finished third in the 10,000. And uh, I think is a guy that can certainly win this race. And then Joshua Chepta guy is another Ugandan who is, uh, it's interesting. So this guy like shattered the world records in the five and 10 K last year, uh, basically solo type runs, uh, clearly probably the most talented guy that is going to run a distance event, but he's a little hurt. Uh, he actually revealed, uh, they, we kind of had some questions about his fitness. He ended up getting second in the 10 K and it was, it was a kind of thing where he ran pretty well, but he just, he just let, he just let a guy get away from him and he couldn't quite chase him down at the end. This guy's still the most talented guy out there. He also revealed after that race, he's, he's dealing a little bit with the heel injury. So I like the chances for the Ugandans. I bet Chep the guy at plus 430. And if you're going to watch this race, if you're going to spend 12 minutes of your life actually watching this race, you want to see the Ugandans push the pace. You want to see them run the kick out of Katir. Uh, they did not do that in the 10,000. They just kind of jogged and, and made it a kicker's race, probably due to the humidity. This is their last race of the Olympics. So their strategy should be to just push the pace. And in an ideal world, they're, 10 meters ahead of everyone else with a lap to go, both of them. And, and it's essentially over that that's the ideal situation. If they, if they let it come down to a kicker's race, yeah, we'll see. I still think they can win, but maybe they're not the favorite. Um, Cause Katir does have the fastest 1500 meter time. Um, so yeah, I would go with the Ugandans. Uh, you can get those. I just got those on FanDuel Sportsbook, and uh, yeah, we'll go with that. With Chepta guy, do you feel it's an advantage that it's his final race given the injury, or is that a disadvantage given that he's been on the heel more often recently? Yeah, well, I mean, these guys don't really land on their heel, so yeah. um, I, I don't know how much that affects him. He looked pretty good in the ten thousand, right? Um, but it's certain, but you know, like it, it, he he's clearly not where he was a year ago, uh, right. which is a bummer because it's it's an Olympic year. And it was kind of the same thing we saw with Noah Lyles. So he was the American that ran the 200. And this man dominated that event two years ago. And he's just not in the same shape. So he got a bronze this year. 
so so yeah i mean things are definitely um you know if it were if we were 12 months ago chip the guy would be minus 300 right but it's not um but i still think you can get it done i i'm still um I'm still going to go with uh, the guys that have, have more of a proven track record, even if they're slightly off their game. And I think that the important thing with something like this is you don't want to double count an injury. Like the injury is the reason he's plus 430, it seems like. So if right. you say he's plus 430, but he's hurt, well, he's plus 430 because he's hurt. So I think that yeah. it's important not to double count that. Yeah, I mean, he was plus 400 in the 10,000 before we knew he was actually injured. Mm -hmm. So so some of it is performance related. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I still think you can get it done. I think, I think it's the right move to go with Ugandans here. Okay. We'll, we'll see if Ed's heater in, uh, in the running <laughs> events can stick uh, with Joshua Chepta guy to win at plus four thirty for the men's 5,000 for my covering the future. I'm going to talk some NFL and I want to go to our subject for today with Aaron and talk about divisional odds. And we talked with the Seahawks last week. We were talking about with JJ about why, you know, they may be more pass heavy than expected. They may be faster than expected and why that makes Russell Wilson an interesting MVP bet. They also came up when I was looking at teams with a bunch of close games, basically which teams are potentially the most subject to volatility this year. And the Seahawks are one of those teams. They have nine games this year where I have their win probability between 45% and 55%. There is this famous Kevin Clark tweet from the ringer where he says, how is every Seahawks game so chaotic, basically? And it gets retweeted every time the Seahawks are in a crazy game. We're probably going to see that tweet a lot this year based on this. That that nine toss-up game number is tied with the Rams for the most in football. The 49ers and Cardinals, the other teams in the NFC West, are tied with the Vikings for third with seven toss-ups in their schedule. The Seahawks have a win probability between 40% and 60% in 12 of their 17 games, which basically means they are volatile. And I think that's a good thing here. That means if they can't close out games, they could have a really poor record or it could be really good. And with Russell Wilson, I have faith in their ability to hit the high end of the range of outcomes. And they also had one of their games get easier because they faced the Colts in week one. They may be without Carson Wentz, Quinton Nelson, Eric Fisher. They opened as two point underdogs, which I thought was kind of weird to begin with. But now they're three point favorites. I've got the Seahawks basically in a dead heat atop the NFC West with the Rams and 49ers, but they're plus 270 to win the division, while both those teams are shorter than plus 200. So I'm going to bet on Russell Wilson and take the Seahawks here at plus 270 to win the NFC West. I have found better numbers elsewhere. Uh, I think plus 275 at, at River. So if you have access to a better number, I would take that. But even at plus 270, I think the Seahawks are a good bet to win the NFC West because they've got Russell Wilson and they've got volatility in their schedule. And I think this is something that, that I try to focus on is identifying good volatility. Volatility is a rough word in general, but I think in betting, if we can find volatile situations where a team is capable of hitting the high end of the range of outcomes, find markets that will be advantageous to them. I think that the NFC West odds of the Seahawks are an example where they could stink if they can't take advantage in close games, but they could also be really good given how close all their games are going to be. Yeah, my policy is not to bet against Russell Wilson <laughs> in the preseason. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with all the things you're saying. I haven't done the deep dive into their defense yet, uh, which has been an issue uh, in the past. But um, but certainly, like uh, that game, that week one game against the Colts. Uh, I, I, I've actually kind of never trusted the Colts defense over the last couple of years. Uh, a lot of people have been more higher on the talent that they have on that side of the ball. And they were actually pretty good for the first part of the season uh, with DeForest Buckner and, and Xavier Rhodes. They really fell off towards the end. Rhodes is, uh, is, is an older player. So yeah, I, I've kind of never trusted their defense. I, I mean, I kind of like Seattle to, to get that done there. And obviously their odds of, of getting that done have gone up. But um, yeah, and if you're one and oh, you're that much more likely to win the division. Right. And it's not just Nelson, not just Wentz. Uh, Ryan Kelly, their center, is very good too. He's out for a couple weeks. Darius Leonard, one of their star, the star of their defense, is banged up right now. Xavier Rhodes is on the COVID list right now. Oh, so, is he? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they've got, they've well, got a lot be, of stuff going on. He should be back from the COVID list. Right. He should. But like, you know, we've seen long term effects if it's actually a positive test. So, it's concerning and it's important not to overreact to injuries, 
but they've got a domino type effect where they have their toughest part of the schedule is their first five games. If they go, you know, hypothetically, zero and five, which I think I have like 6% odds that are happening, like it could snowball. And I think that they are, if we're identifying teams that have really low floors as a result of potentially tough beginnings, the right. Colts are one, the Eagles sure. are another where mm-hmm. things could get out of hand pretty quickly. If, if, if things aren't going their way. Right. And, and I feel like those are two teams. They, they have very low floors because of uncertain Correct. quarterback situations. And they were two teams. I was looking for reasons not to bet to begin with. So I will happily take those outs and avoid them as a result of the early season schedule. That is all that we have here for today on covering the spread. Big thank you once again to Aaron Dolan for swinging by and breaking down her thoughts on these divisional odds. Find her on Twitter at Aaron Kate Dolan and check out all of her work over at FanDuel. Ed, what is going on for you this week over at the Power Rank? Yeah, the Power Rank, uh, get my uh, free email newsletter. Uh, it's my data-driven sport, uh, betting information. Uh, it's been something that's revamped. Um, so check that out at the thepowerrank.com. Also, I had a pre- couple of uh, pretty awesome interviews at the Football Analytics Show. I talked to Mike Craig, who is a pro sports better. He has been on the show with us, and I think crushed it with the with the college football that he did that week with us last uh time we'll have him on again for sure on the show but i did a I did a deep dive on uh just kind of fundamentals of sports betting we didn't we didn't uh cool. talk about anything preseason but more just general concepts uh so that was a really fun conversation that has been getting some attention on twitter uh, i also talked to bill Connolly of espn this week uh, that is not quite up, but it should be up uh, somewhat soon. And that was, I mean, Bill Bill is incredible and needs no introduction when you're talking about yeah. college football analytics and, and betting. That is two. Those are two awesome guests. Okay, so check that out by searching for the Football Analytics Show. Always good to get a good refresher on general practices before the season. So the Mike Craig one, I think there, and then Bill Connolly is Bill Connolly. So uh, a lot of good stuff there. Check out Ed's work over at the Power Rank and check him out on Twitter at the Power Rank. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald and Joy Affleck for chopping up some snippets from this podcast for the FanDuel social media accounts. Thank you, Joy and Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning Tuning in. Good luck to you with your NFL preseason bets if you decide to dabble in those waters. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. Aaron Dolan here. Thanks for watching and make sure you click below on that subscribe button for more great FanDuel content and check out some of our latest uploads and playlists right over here.